Thus, when a young woman named Mercy Short became possessed by the devil, she described the beast who had visited her as a wretch no taller than an ordinary walking staff. He was not of a negro, but of a tawny or an Indian color. He wore a high-crowned hat, with straight hair, and had one cloven foot. Observed Slotkin. He was, in fact, a figure out of the American Puritan nightmare. Indian colored, dressed in a Christian's hat, with a beast's foot. A kind of Indian Puritan, man-animal half-breed. In the preceding chapter, we explored at some length Catholic doctrines of asceticism, purity, and religious self-righteousness and intolerance, as well as the Church's murderous treatment of those it regarded as unchaste and impure non-believers. But Protestantism deserves some scrutiny in its own right, for even though most of England's Protestants had shunted aside asceticism of the specifically contemptus mundi variety, the anti-Roman elements of the faith condemned monastic withdrawal from the world, and insisted that saints partake, albeit in moderation, of the earthly gifts that God had provided for men and women, asceticism in the larger sense remained alive and well for centuries. Indeed, probably never before in Christian history had the idea that humankind was naturally corrupt and debased reached and influenced the daily lives of a larger proportion of the lay community than during New England's 17th and early 18th centuries. New England Congregationalist Susanna Anthony was only one among many thousands of Protestant divines who, as late as the 1760s, delighted in examining her soul and, in phrases reminiscent of her saintly Catholic sisters from four and five centuries earlier, discovering the sinfulness of my nature, the corrupt fountain from whence proceeded every sinful act. My heart has looked like a sink of sin, more loathsome than the most offensive carrion that swarms with hateful vermin, my understanding dark and ignorant, my will stubborn, my affections carnal, corrupt and disordered, every faculty depraved and vitiated, my whole soul deformed and polluted, filled with pride, enmity, carnality, hypocrisy, self-confidence, and all manner of sins. Woe is me, because of the leprosy of sin, by which I am so defiled, that I pollute all I touch. Good God, what a leprous soul is this! How polluted! How defiled! What a running sore that pollutes all I touch! Unlike her medieval Catholic forebears, Miss Anthony did not, as far as we know, accompany this torrent of self-hatred with self-inflicted physical abuse. But like them before her, the more she expressed her loathing for the rottenness of her heart and will and all her sensual affections, the more admirable and godly a person she was in her own eyes and in those of others. Such sanctification of what one commentator has described as the furtive gratifications of an ascetic sadism was, after all, the evangelical way. And as Philip Grevin clearly has shown, in the fanatical and obsessive efforts of people like Miss Anthony and her spiritual kin to placate implacable consciences and in their systematic efforts to mortify and subdue the body and the self, along with their consequently heightened perception of the world as a dangerous and seductive place, the early New England settlers of evangelical Puritan character often saw evidence of anger and hostility in other people which they denied within themselves. And in no people did they see such things so clearly as in the indigenous people of the territory they were invading who became the unwilling victims of the Protestants' unending warfare with the unregenerate world in which they lived. This also is why what David Bryan Davis once said about the belated emergence of the anti-slavery movement was equally true regarding the unlikelihood of any semblance of humanitarian concern for the Indians gaining serious support during this time. It could not and would not happen so long as Christians continued to believe that natural man was totally corrupt, that suffering and subordination were necessary parts of life, and that the only true freedom lay in salvation from the world. For a core principle of the saintly Puritan's belief system was that the natural condition of the hearts of all humans prior to their conversion to Christ, even the hearts of the holiest and most innocent of Christian infants, was, in the esteemed New England minister Benjamin Wadsworth's words, a mere nest, root, fountain of sin and wickedness. <laughs>
by defining the Indians as bestial and as hopelessly beyond conversion then, the colonists were declaring flatly that these very same words aptly describe the natives' permanent racial condition, and to tolerate known sin and wickedness in their midst would be to commit sin and wickedness themselves. Moreover, and ominously, from the earliest days of settlement, the British colonists repeatedly expressed a haunting fear that they would be contaminated by the presence of the Indians, a contamination that must be avoided lest it become the beginning of a terrifying downward slide toward their own bestial degeneration. Thus, unlike the Spanish before them, British men in the colonies from the Carolinas to New England rarely engaged in sexual relations with the Indians, even during those times when there were few, if any, English women available. Legislation was passed that banished forever such mixed-race couples, referring to their offspring in animalistic terms as abominable mixture and spurious issue, though even without formal prohibitions such intimate encounters were commonly reckoned a horrid crime with us, in the words of one colonial Pennsylvanian. It is little wonder, then, that Mercy Short described the creature that possessed her as both a demon and, in Slotkin's words, a kind of Indian, Puritan, man-animal half-breed, for this was the ultimate and fated consequence of racial contamination. Again, however, such theological, psychological, and legislative preoccupations did not proceed to the rationalization of genocide without a social foundation and impetus. And if a possessive and tightly constricted attitude towards sex, an abhorrence of racial intermixture, and a belief in humankind's innate depravity had for centuries been hallmarks of Christianity, and therefore of the West's definition of civilization, by the time the British exploration and settlement of America had begun, the very essence of humanity also was coming to be associated in European thought with a similarly possessive, exclusive, and constricted attitude toward property. For it is precisely of this time that R. H. Tawney was writing when he observed the movement away from the earlier medieval belief that private property is a necessary institution, at least in a fallen world, but it is to be tolerated as a concession to human frailty, not applauded as desirable in itself, to the notion that the individual is absolute master of his own, and within the limits set by positive law, may exploit it with a single eye to his pecuniary advantage, unrestrained by any obligation to postpone his own profit to the well-being of his neighbors, or to give account of his actions to a higher authority. The concept of private property as a positive good, and even an insignia of civilization, took hold among both Catholics and Protestants during the sixteenth century. Thus, for example, in Spain, Juan Ginés de Sepúlveda argued that the absence of private property was one of the characteristics of people lacking even vestiges of humanity. And in Germany at the same time, Martin Luther was contending that the possession of private property was an essential difference between men and beasts. In England, meanwhile, Sir Thomas More was proclaiming that land justifiably could be taken from any people who holdeth a piece of ground, void and vacant to no good or profitable use. An idea that also was being independently advanced in other countries by Calvin, Melanchthon, and others. Typically, though, none was as churlish as Luther, who pointed out that the Catholic St. Francis had urged his followers to get rid of their property and give it to the poor. I do not maintain that St. Francis was simply wicked, wrote Luther, but his works show that he was a weak-minded and freakish man, or, to say the truth, a fool. The idea that failure to put property to good or profitable use was grounds for seizing it became especially popular with Protestants, who thereby advocated confiscating the lands owned by Catholic monks. As Richard Schlatter explains, the monks were condemned not for owning property, but because they did not use that property in an economically productive fashion. At best, they used it to produce prayers. Luther and the other Reformation leaders insisted that it should be used not to relieve men from the necessity of working, but as a tool for making more goods. The attitude of the Reformation was practically not prayers, but production, and production not for consumption, but for more production. The idea of production for the sake of production, of course, was one of the central components of what Max Weber was to call the Protestant ethic, 
but it also was essential to what C.B. McPherson has termed the ideology of possessive individualism. And at the heart of that ideology was a political theory of appropriation that was given its fullest elaboration in the second of John Locke's two treatises of government. In addition to the property of his own person, Locke argued, all men have a right to their own labor and to the fruits of that labor. When a person's private labor is put to the task of gathering provisions from the common realm, the provisions thus gathered become the private property of the one who labored to gather them, so long as there are more goods left in the common realm for others to gather with their labor. But beyond the right to the goods of the land, Locke argued, was the right to the earth itself. It is, he says, plain that the same logic holds with the land itself as with the products of the land. As much land as a man tills, plants, improves, cultivates, and can use the product of, so much is his property. He by his labor does, as it were, enclose it from the common. Only through the ability to exercise such individual acquisitiveness, thought Locke, does a man become fully and truly human. However, notes Macpherson, concealed within this celebration of grasping and exclusive individualism was the equally essential notion that full individuality for some was produced by consuming the individuality of others. Thus, the greatness of seventeenth-century liberalism was its assertion of the free, rational individual as the criterion of the good society. Its tragedy was that this very assertion was necessarily a denial of individualism to half the nation. Indeed, more than a denial of individualism, Locke's proposals for how to treat the landless poor of his own country, whom he considered a morally depraved lot, were draconian. They were to be placed into workhouses and forced to perform hard labor, as were all their children above the age of three. As Edmund S. Morgan observes, this proposal stopped a little short of enslavement, though it may require a certain refinement of mind to discern the difference. Locke's work, of course, post-dates the era of early British colonization in North America, but the kernels of at least these aspects of his thought were present and articulated prior to the founding of the English colonies in the work of Luther, Calvin, Moore, Melanchthon, and other British and continental thinkers. An obvious conclusion derivable from such an ideology was that those without a Western sense of private property were, by definition, not putting their land to good or profitable use, as Moore phrased it, and that therefore they deserved to be dispossessed of it. Thus, in Moore's Utopia, first published in Latin in 1516 and in English in 1551, he envisions the founding of a colony wherever the natives have much unoccupied and uncultivated land. Should the natives object to this taking of their property, or should they refuse to live according to their, the settlers, laws, the settlers are justified in driving the natives from the territory which they carve out for themselves. If they resist, they wage war against them. In practice, this became known as the principle of vacuum domicilium, and the British colonists in New England appealed to it enthusiastically as they seized the shared common lands of the Indians. One of the first formal expressions of this justification for expropriation by a British colonist was published in London in 1622 as part of a work titled Mort's Relation, or a journal of the plantation of Plymouth. The author of this piece describes the lawfulness of removing out of England into parts of America, as deriving first from the singular fact that our land is full and their land is empty. He then continues, This, then, is a sufficient reason to prove our going thither to live lawful. Their land is spacious and void, and they are few and do but run over the grass, as do also the foxes and wild beasts. They are not industrious, neither have they art, science, skill, or faculty to use either the land or the commodities of it, but all spoils, rots, and is marred for want of manuring, gathering, ordering, etc. As the ancient patriarchs therefore removed from straighter places into more roomy ones, where the land lay idle and wasted, and none used it, though there dwelt inhabitants by them, so is it lawful now to take a land which none useth, and make use of it. The most well-known and most sophisticated statement on the matter, however, came from the pen of the first governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, John Winthrop. While still in England, on the eve of joining what became known as the Great Migration to Massachusetts in the 1630s, Winthrop compiled a manuscript 
justifying the undertakers of the intended plantation in New England, and answering specific questions that might be raised against the enterprise. The first justification, as with Columbus nearly a century and a half earlier, was spiritual, to carry the gospel into those parts of the world, to help on the coming of the fullness of the Gentiles, and to raise a bulwark against the kingdom of Antichrist, an understandable reason for a people who believed the world was likely to come to an end during their lifetime. Very quickly, however, Winthrop got to the possible charge that, we have no warrant to enter upon that land which hath been so long possessed by others. He answered, That which lies common, and hath never been replenished or subdued, is free to any that possess and improve it. For God hath given to the sons of men a double right to the earth. There is a natural right, and a civil right. The first right was natural when men held the earth in common, every man sowing and feeding where he pleased. Then, as men and their cattle increased, they appropriated certain parcels of ground by enclosing and peculiar manurance, and this in time got them a civil right. As for the natives in New England, they enclose no land, neither have any settled habitation, nor any tame cattle to improve the land by, and so have no other but a natural right to those countries. So, as if we leave them sufficient for their use, we may lawfully take the rest there being more than enough for them and us. In point of fact, the Indians had thoroughly improved the land, that is, cultivated it, for centuries. They also possessed carefully structured and elaborated concepts of land use and of the limits of political dominion, and they were, as Roger Williams observed in 1643, very exact and punctual in the bounds of their land, belonging to this or that prince or people. This was, however, not private ownership, as the English defined the term, and it is true that probably no native people anywhere in the Western Hemisphere would have countenanced a land-use system that, to return to Tawney's language, allowed a private individual to exploit the land with a single eye to his pecuniary advantage, unrestrained by any obligation to postpone his own profit to the well-being of his neighbors. And thus, in the view of the English, were the Indian nations savage. For, unlike the majority of the Spanish before them, who, in Las Casas's words, killed and destroyed such an infinite number of souls only to acquire gold and to swell themselves with riches in a very brief time, and thus rise to a high estate disproportioned to their merits, all that the English wanted was the land. To that end the Indians were merely an impediment. Unlike the situation in New Spain, the natives living in what were to become the English colonies had, in effect, no use value. With the exception of the earliest British explorers in the sixteenth century, England's adventurers and colonists in the New World had few illusions of finding gold or of capturing Indians for large-scale enslavement. Nor did they have an impoverished European homeland like Spain that was desperate for precious goods that might be found or stolen or wrenched from American soil, with forced native labor, in order to sustain its imperial expansion. They did, however, have a homeland that seemed to be bursting at the seams with Englishmen, and they felt they needed what in another language, in another time, became known as Lebensraum. And so during the first century of successful British settlement in North America, approximately twice as many Englishmen and women moved to the New World as had relocated from Spain to New Spain during the previous hundred years. And unlike the vast majority of the Spanish, the British came with families, and they came to stay. To that flood of British colonists, the Indians were at best a superfluous population, at least once they had taught the English how to survive. In Virginia, true plantation agriculture did not begin until after most of the Indians had been exterminated, whereupon African slaves were imported to carry out the heavy work, while in New England the colonists would do most of the agricultural tasks themselves with the help of British indentured servants, but they required open land to settle and to cultivate. A simple comparison between the inducements that were given the early Spanish and the early British New World settlers reveals the fundamental difference between the two invasions. The Spanish, with the repartimiento, were awarded not land, but large numbers of native people to enslave and do with what they wished. The English, with the head right, were provided not with native people, but with fifty acres of land for themselves, 
and fifty acres more for each additional settler whose transatlantic transportation costs they paid. These differences in what material things they sought had deep effects as well on how the Spanish and the English would interpret their respective American environments and the native peoples they encountered there. Thus, however much they slaughtered the natives who fell within their orbit, the Spanish endlessly debated the ethical aspects of what it was that they were doing, forcing upon themselves elaborate, if often contorted and contradictory, rationalizations for the genocide they were committing. As we saw earlier, for example, Franciscans and Dominicans in Latin America argued strenuously over what God's purpose was in sending plagues to kill the Indians, some of them contending that he was punishing the natives for their sins, while others claimed he was chastening the Spanish for their cruelties by depriving them of their slaves. Additionally, throughout the first century of conquest, Spanish scholars were embroiled in seemingly endless debates over the ethical and legal propriety of seizing and appropriating Indian lands, disputes that continued to haunt independence struggles in Spanish America well into the 19th century. No such disputation took place among the Anglo-American colonists or ministers, however, because they had little doubt as to why God was killing off the Indians, or to whom the land rightfully belonged. It is, in short, no accident that the British did not produce their own Las Casas. As early as the first explorations at Roanoke, Thomas Harriet had observed that whenever the English visited an Indian village, within a few days after our departure the people began to die very fast, and many in a short space, in some towns about twenty, in some forty, in some sixty, and in one six score, which in truth was very many in respect of their numbers. As usual, the British were unaffected by these mysterious plagues. In initial explanation, Harriet could only report that some astrologers, knowing of the eclipse of the sun, which we saw the same year before on our voyage thitherward, thought that might have some bearing on the matter. But such events as solar eclipses and comets, which Harriet also mentions as possibly having some relevance, were, like the epidemics themselves, the work of God. No other interpretation was possible. And that was why, before long, Harriet also was reporting that there seemed to be a divinely drawn pattern to the diseases. Miraculously, he said, they affected only those Indian communities where we had any subtle device practiced against us. In other words, the Lord was selectively punishing only those Indians who plotted against the English. Needless to say, the reverse of that logic was equally satisfying. That is, that only those Indians who went unpunished were not evil. And if virtually all were punished, the answer was obvious. As William Bradford was to conclude some years later, when epidemics almost totally destroyed the Indian population of Plymouth Colony, without affecting the English, it pleased God to visit these Indians with a great sickness and such a mortality that of a thousand, above nine and a half hundred of them died, and many of them did rot above the ground for want of burial. All followers of the Lord could only give thanks to the marvelous goodness and providence of God, Bradford concluded. It was a refrain that soon would be heard throughout the land. After all, prior to the Europeans' arrival, the New World had been but a hideous and desolate wilderness, Bradford said elsewhere, a land full of wild beasts and wild men. In killing the Indians in massive numbers, then, the English were only doing their sacred duty, working hand in hand with the God who was protecting them. For nothing else, only divine intervention, could account for the prodigious pestilence that repeatedly swept the land of nineteen out of every twenty Indian inhabitants, wrote Cotton Mather, so that the woods were almost cleared of these pernicious creatures to make room for a better growth. Often this teamwork of God and man seemed to be perfection itself, as in King Philip's war. Mather recalled that in one battle of that war, the English attacked the native people with such ferocity that their city was laid in ashes. Above twenty of their chief captains were killed. A proportionable desolation cut off the interior salvages. Mortal sickness and horrid famine pursued the remainders of them, so we can hardly tell where any of them are left alive upon the face of the earth. Thus the militant agencies of God and his chosen people became as one. Mather believed, as many others, that at some time in the distant past the miserable salvages known as Indians had been decoyed by the devil to live in isolation in America 
in hopes that the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ would never come here to destroy or disturb his absolute empire over them. But God had located the evil roots, and sent his holiest Christian warriors over from England, where, with the help of some divinely sprinkled plagues, they joyously had irradiated an Indian wilderness. It truly was, as another New England saint entitled his own history of the holy settlement, a wonder-working providence.